So now let's look at another UFO, an unidentified flying object. Yeah. This one, you've all seen it. It's called the moon. But the moon's a very strange place. We've got the Maria, which they call the seas, uh, which appear to be molten rocks that was thrown up onto the surface and then cooled into the what they call the Maria. Uh, and that's why when they went to the moon, they were expecting to find volcanic activity. And yet when they get to the moon, we find there is no volcanic activity. It's a dead world. So where did this molten rock come from? We don't know. But at the center of these circular seas, or maria, are what they call mascons. The mascons are very heavy, dense objects of something that are somehow always at the center of these maria. Are they some kind of ancient machine that spewed up molten rock on the surface of the moon? We don't know. We don't know what the mascons are. We don't know what the maria is. The, the moon is very mysterious. Now here is uh, some figures drawn by early man, similar to the Nazca Plains, which you all are probably similar with. And on the moon, we find similar type designs. Okay, now where does that come from? Is it natural? We don't know. But we're not being told either. Always remember, NASA mean is short for yeah. never a straight answer. <laughs> we also have what's known as the shard photograph from the lunar orbiter 111. And this thing juts up off the surface of the moon about a mile. Just like a little spindle or a tower. Is that a microwave tower? Who knows? We don't know, but it's very mysterious. We've had we've got pictures. These are all NASA photographs, by the way. Look at this thing flitting across the surface of the moon. This thing throwing a shadow on the surface of the moon. What is this thing? And here's one jutting out over a, a, a crater. All kinds of odd stuff. People have been seeing weird things on the moon for centuries. All the way back into the, when they first developed telescopes, they were seeing lights moving around on the moon. They were seeing what appeared to be clouds of dust or some sort of particles moving around on the moon. You didn't get taught this in school, though, did you? Well, we can see in this crater <coughs> some kind of uh, weird object. Again, we see this long cigar-looking type object sitting in a crater on the moon. What is this? We don't know. Yes, I love this one. You see the tracks running along here to this little circular type object, and it's rolled a lot of leaving tracks on the moon. Now, your, my first thought was, oh, well, it came, it was up here on the top of this crater, and it rolled off and rolled down the, the side of the crater, which is possibly so. Now, unfortunately, this came out of a book, and uh, the reproduction reproduction is not very good, but I, I've seen a clear photograph, and the tracks go down into the crater, so it rolled up the side of the crater and then down the side of the crater. Something's moving around on the moon. Hmm, what is it? Don't ask me. I'm just giving you the information. More tracks on the moon. And uh, here's an odd little X in the middle of a crater. We don't know what this is, but it's all very odd. The day before the Apollo 11 landed on the moon, the uh, astronauts reported sighting some mysterious lunar lights in an area where scientists believe there are volcanoes. This is back when they were still saying there was volcanic activity on the moon, so it was okay to release this story. And uh, he said it was, uh, it was in the crater Aristarchus, in the northeastern part of the moon's face. And astronomers had claimed observing bright spots in the area which they appear to be volcanoes. And all, Buzz Aldrin said, well, the area is definitely brighter than anything else I can see. And uh, so this has all been dutifully reported, but then it goes dark. You don't hear any more about that. So what is with the moon anyway? Um, when I was in school, we were taught the moon broke away from the Earth. And maybe that's what created the big hole, which is now the Pacific Ocean. 
But now that they say we've been to the moon and we got lunar rocks and they don't match the same composition as what's on the Earth, plus they found rocks on the moon that date back before 8 billion years ago, which is older than the age of the Earth, then now it's changed. Now the idea is the capture theory that the moon came along and was captured in the uh, gravitational field of the Earth. <laughs> the problem is this. If here's the Earth and here comes the moon and it's caught and it's pulled back, then the moon should be in an elliptical orbit, kind of wobbling around the Earth. But it's not. It's in a near-perfect circular orbit and stationary, one side always facing the Earth. We know this, you were taught this in school, but you really had never stopped to think about it. How did it get like that? Isaac Asimov, famous science fiction writer and a, and a very noted scientist, said the moon shouldn't be where it is. How did it get there? And, by the way, the moon is at the exact distance away from the Earth so that when there is a solar eclipse, it is, covers the exact circumference of the sun. You can see the corona of the sun all around it, but you can't see the sun because it's at the exact distance from the earth where it blocks out just the exact circumference of the sun. Whoa, oh, that's pretty precise. How does that happen naturally? The answer is, it cannot. So that means somebody parked the moon. But here we get to the conundrum of extraterrestrials. Because we all know there's no such thing as extraterrestrial. But we also know that the moon is in a very unusual orbit, and somebody must have parked it there. It's been there since our recorded history, so we know we didn't do it. And so, since we know there's no such thing as extraterrestrials, how do we deal with this subject? We don't. We just don't talk about it. <laughs> okay? Go ask some of your astronomer friends. How did the moon get there? And let them start shuffling and jiving and trying to come up with an explanation because we don't know. So apparently somebody came in and parked the moon exactly where it is. And the moon's orbit is nearly perfect circular to the Earth with only a slight wobble which just coincided, coincidentally matches the slight wobble of the uh, orbit of the Earth. And it's also at the equator. There also appears to be pyramids on the moon. You can see what appears to be pyramids in this uh, crater up here. And in other areas too. Interestingly enough, the pyramids that are sighted on the moon are in the same configuration as the three major pyramids on the Giza Plateau. And if that's not odd enough, we look at Teotihuacan outside Mexico City, and if you'll simply shift that thing around, they're in the same configuration as the pyramids on the Giza Plateau. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that get to be? Something's going on here, folks. And now, of course, we see the pyramids on Mars. Oh, yeah. Mars yeah. Okay? And the famous space on Mars. Now, just for you all tonight, got a special treat for you. I'm going to show you a close-up <coughs> of the face on Mars. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> Enough levity. Actually, here's the face on Mars. And then, of course, when NASA it finally was, you know, the, it got to be a big deal, they finally showed us this picture. Oh, yeah, well, we can really see that one. And by the way, there's been much more further work done on this. This is kind of an old slideshow. And now they've, they've actually done computer work on it. And there, there's something on the face of Mars. And again, we didn't put it there. But we know there's no extraterrestrials, so let's just don't talk about that. By the way, here's another face on Mars. I think, I think everybody can kind of see this one. And I don't know. This is in my huff file. It is possible that those are just natural formations there that you make a face out of it, kind of like you do making a, the face of Jesus out of a cloud or something, you know. But it's still pretty amazing. And, of course, we've got the rover sojourner that went up there and crawled around for a few feet. 
And uh, they said, see, no life on Mars. <laughs> well, excuse me, think about this. What if we lived on Mars and we sent a little rover and it landed in Antarctica and it, and it roamed around for about 20 or 30 feet? Hey, no life on the Earth. <laughs> By the way, it's all changing. It's all changing. Uh, we now know there's water on the moon. We now know there's winds on the moon. We know there's water on Mars. They just, they just were finally announcing that last week. Okay, so everything you think you know about Moon and Mars, you don't know. Because they haven't told you and it's changing constantly. This kind of leads to the question, well, if there's ETs been around here, how long have they been here? Or did our ancestors come from space? Well, you go back to the Sumerian tablets, which are probably the oldest records on the world. In fact, actually, you can go to the Hindu Vedas, and they talk about the violence. And flying machines that went through the air and all their god carried their gods around, and that they had, by the way, they had uh, some sort of weaponry that could destroy a whole city with a single strike. Then you go back to the uh, Sumerian tablets, and this was all etched in clay back about uh, seven, eight thousand years ago. Predates the Egyptians by three or four thousand years. Predates the Bible by five thousand years, and they're telling us that the Anunnaki came to the earth. Well, who's the Anunnaki? Well, that translates as those who came from the heavens to the earth. Well, let me clear something up here. I'm not sure if I get into this. Let me see if I get into it. There is a common theme all over the earth in all the ancient legends and stories. And the common theme is flight. The Chinese had the flying dragons. The Egyptians had the flying boats. The uh, the Sumerians had their flying disc. We all know the story of Ezekiel in the Bible and the fiery wheel. You know, if that wasn't a UFO experience, I don't know what was. And we have artifacts, anomalies, <coughs> as the scientists would call them, because it doesn't conveniently fit into the little homogenized history that we've all been told. We've got these little dudes that have been found down in Colombia and dated back several thousand years. It looks like a little jet plane to me. And by the way, I don't think I have a graphic of this, but some of you have probably seen this picture. Yep. Uh, my wife and I just got back from a trip to Egypt and in Seti's temple up on the ceiling, you see these reliefs. And I swear to God, one of them looks like an Apache helicopter. And right next to it is a little fat jet with wings and a tail exactly like you're seeing here. It's like, what in the world were these people drawing, you know? And, or, and is this some kind of just incredible coincidence? Or was there high technology in the ancient past? This is the Antikythera mechanism, which was discovered back about 1911 or so. Uh, it was sunk in an ancient Greek ship. They dated it back to a couple thousand years ago. And uh, at first, they didn't know what it was, but then as the years rolled on and we got kind of computer savvy, they realized it was a computer. <laughs> it's got little gears within gears within yeah. gears, and uh, it was really quite advanced. And this, was, and this of course, was made centuries before even the uh, invention of the printing press. So we got all this stuff. The ancient Sumerians, by the way, in this uh, relief, show us the... Uh, planets of the solar system and their relative size. How'd they know all that? Uh, Pluto was only discovered in 1930 and Neptune in 1846. How did these ancient Sumerians know the makeup, composition, and relative sizes of our solar system unless they had ancient information? Other artifacts around the world are this a hammer there, or this axe that was found buried in a stone, and the stone tracks back to several thousand years. You got human handprints. You all know about the human footprints down at Paluxy, uh, or near Glenrose, that's in the same strata with dinosaurs. Where'd that come from? You've got the round balls of Guatemala, these perfectly round balls. Try to make something round. Get you some clay and try to make by hand a perfectly round ball. You're going to have a real tough time of it, okay? And that these, are, but yet these are perfectly round, and some of them are huge. Some of them are four, eight feet in diameter. Where they come from? Who made them? We don't know. You got the Baghdad battery. They found this over in Iraq, which uh, used to be ancient Mesopotamia, which in the Bible was called. Uh, 
Chaldea. And by the way, the patriarch of both the Jews and the Palestinians was Abraham. And where did Abraham come from? Was he just some Semite dragging his tent through the desert? No. He came from Ur of Chaldea. Ur is one of the major cities in ancient Samaria. He was a Sumerian. He had the knowledge. And he brought it into Egypt. And the next thing you know, there's this huge technologically advanced civilization in Egypt. Um, so from the side of ancient uh, cities in Iraq, the one place where you can't go now, in fact, I don't think anybody really wants to go, we found the Baghdad battery. And they didn't know what this was for a long time until somebody figured out you can put grape juice in there that's highly acidic, put the copper tube in, put the other thing in, you get a half bolt of electricity. So they had electricity all the way back there. They knew about this. You don't get taught that in school, do you? That's not there anymore. <laughs> no, it's in the yeah. museum. It's still around. Oh, yeah, right. it's still around. Right. This is a 1680 French coin, and look, here's the town and steeple and countryside, and here's this giant wheel flying through the sky. They, they, they tried to tell us this for years. Everybody knew about this. They just didn't know what it was. We're the, only, we're the first generations who grew up with the true knowledge of space flight, cloning, genetic manipulation. We could understand all this stuff where they couldn't, but we don't get told about this. In fact, I strongly suspect that a major reason for our precipitous and unprovoked attack on Iraq was to loot the Iraqi National Museum. Because I have the stories in my files from 1999, 2000, 2001, that French and German archaeological teams were making amazing new discoveries in the ancient Sumerian cities of Uruk and Ur. And of course, where would that all be taken? To the Iraqi National Museum. And would they immediately put it on display? No. It would be taken and stored in the basement until they could catalog it and study it, clean it all up, and prepare it for exhibition. We do know that Saddam Hussein believed himself the reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar and that he was rebuilding Babylon. So he obviously had a great interest in all this. I find it also interesting that the two nations who most opposed our invasion of Iraq were France and Germany who had the archaeological teams in there. And, we, and when we launched our invasion, contrary to standard military tactics, which is to go and seize your objective, hold your objective, consolidate the countryside and your winnings, and then move on to the next objective, we simply made a beeline for Baghdad. And this is why we never, we failed to pacify the countryside and we're still having problems. And what happened in Baghdad? the looting of the Iraqi National Museum, even though the Pentagon, at the request of rural museum directors, had pledged that we would safeguard the Iraqi National Museum because it was, after all, in the very <coughs> center of the creation of, of the human race. Between the Tigris-Euphrates River, this is all, this is where people estimate the Garden of Eden was. This is where it all started. Western civilization started between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And they pledged they would safeguard it. And yet, when the mobs, probably hired stooges, began to break into the museum, the U.S. military was called, a tank with some soldiers showed up, and then were ordered to withdraw. And the crowds had their way. Well, the crowds were probably a smoke screen, and there was a very systematic looting of the Iraqi National Museum. And according to Colonel Matthew Bogdanos, who investigated the museum break-in for General Tommy Franks. In an article in uh, Archaeological Magazine, he said the basement was an inside job. They had keys to the vaults. They bypassed expensive-looking fakes. They, guards were suspiciously missing that day. And they got, and then said, of all the stuff that the hired mob took out of the upper floors of the museum, uh, a greater part of that has now been returned. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, you know, Abdul got something, went out, and what's he going to do with it? He's going to take it to the local flea market, <laughs> try to get some money for it, and it will find its way back to the museum. So they've recovered most of this. But Bagnano said the basement 
said they haven't recovered hardly anything they took out of the basement. And what would have been in the basement? Stargate. The newly found stuff. Star, a Stargate, okay? Yeah. A, 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 who knows what? But uh, they've got to have that ancient technology. And where did it come from? It didn't come from us. Oh, here is the skull of an auroch, an extinct ox, that uh, has, for what all practical purposes, appears to be a bullet hole in it. And this ox has been dated back several thousand years, long before there were any firearms. So who knows? Are we talking about aliens? Are we talking about extraterrestrial uh, beings? Are we talking about interdimensional beings? Or are we talking about time travelers? I don't know. All I'm trying to tell you is there's a reality here that we're not being told about. Now, after, between 1897 and the Aurora spaceship crash, which, by the way, while I was uh, doing a documentary on that, a fellow showed up with his young son, and we were filming at the Wise County Courthouse. And he said, hey, what are you guys doing? And we, I said, well, we're making a documentary about the spaceship crash in Aurora back in 1897. He says, oh, I know all about that. My grandfather was there. So I immediately had him sign a release and set him down and an interview with him. And one of the interesting things that came out of this interview, because his grandfather had similar to what I'd already heard. There was an explosion. People heard it. They ran into town. There was all this metal lying around. They all picked it up, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But his grandfather added a, one little added note. He said that within hours, representatives of every law enforcement agency in Texas were showing up. I said, well, what did he say they did? He said, well, about half of them went around saying, okay, folks, go back to your home. You know, it's all over here, nothing to see. And the other half were loading up the metal and putting it in wagons and hauling it off. Hmm. In other words, perhaps the earliest crash retrieval. Yeah. But between 1897 and the crash retrieval at Roswell in 1947, we had the Los Angeles Air Raid, which I'm sure most of you have never heard about. February the 25th, 1942. Now, this is only uh, two months or so after Pearl Harbor. And the West Coast was jittery, with good reason. The Hawaiian Islands had been attacked, the Sixth Fleet had been sunk, and there were reports and, and rumors flying that the Japanese were about to invade the West Coast at any minute. And that wasn't all just hearsay. Uh, about a month before this, in January 1942, a Japanese submarine had surfaced off the coast of California and shelled an oil refinery. So their war jitters were not entirely unjustified. On the night of February the 25th, they used one of our new secret weapons, radar. And they had just installed it there in Los Angeles. And the new radar picked up a flight of objects coming at very high speed, uh, uh, eastward across the Pacific on a trajectory towards Los Angeles. So at about 11 o'clock at night, the air raid sirens went off, and from 11 to like 2 in the morning, there was a constant booming as the anti-aircraft guns expended thousands of rounds of ammunition, searchlights were playing in the sky, people died, there were at least six casualties, uh, several from heart attacks, some from car crashes, some from being hit by ordnance falling back to earth. A lot of damage to white homes with, you know, you fire a thousand rounds of anti-aircraft fire into the air, and there's pieces of junk's going to fall back down and cause some damage. Those of you who want to celebrate firing a gun in the air, remember that. <laughs> okay. The Army said this was a real alarm. But the next day, higher authorities, uh, General, uh, I mean, uh, Harold Stimson, the Secretary of War, said, no, 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 nothing happened, it's just war jitters. So it quickly dropped from the media and <coughs> dropped from everybody's memory because World War II was on. Jimmy Doolittle's raid took place shortly after this. Then, uh, you know, we lost the Philippines and then, et cetera, et cetera. History moved on and everybody forgot about the Los Angeles Air Raid. But we still have the photographs that were made there, including this one. And some enterprising person with a computer got the photograph and simply reversed it. And, uh, oops, now we see that they weren't just war jitters. There really was something. These little bright spots, by the way, are just explosions from the anti-aircraft gun. Hmm. Let me go back. See? Yeah. 
That, that's the air, aircraft explosions. You can almost see the object right here. But when you reverse the photograph, it's very clear. You got a saucer shaped, shaped object. Now, furthermore, we now have these documents, which was a, a memo uh, from FDR to George Marshall regarding the recovery of unconventional aircraft. As indicated in my recent truck memorandum to you regarding the war, uh, the air uh, raid over Los Angeles has been learned from Army GQ that Rear Admiral Anderson uh, with Naval Intelligence has informed the War Department of a naval recovery of an unidentified plane off the coast of California, unlike uh, any having any uh, bearing on conventional explanation. Further, it was revealed that the Army Air Corps had recovered a similar object in the San Bernardino Mountains east of Los Angeles, which cannot be identified as conventional aircraft. So in 1942, they're recovering unconventional aircraft that they know does not belong to us. And I'm sure it didn't take them long to figure out it didn't belong to the Japanese either. Now, here's what's interesting. At the bottom of uh, this memo, we see that uh, George Marshall says, the, the Chief of Staff, I have further ordered a thorough investigation of all War Department files regarding unconventional aerial phenomena reported since 1897. <laughs> <laughs> the very year of the Aurora Spaceship Crash. See how it all fits together? It's all real, folks. It's very real. Of course, you know about the Foo Fighters during World War II, and the Germans, uh, we said, well, it's a, here's, here's a uh, clip from the New York Times, uh, said the, it's the Nazis' newest war device, and uh, after the war, we found out the Nazis thought they were some kind of secret weapon of ours, okay, so it didn't belong to any of us. The Japanese reported them, too, by the way, and there were reports of these fireballs in, in the Pacific. Now, some of these may have indeed been a Nazi secret weapon called the Fora Ball, or the Fireball, uh, which was a little device that they would put up in the bomber formations in the hopes of disrupting their electrical systems, okay? The problem was, back then, we were using these heavily insulated wires and uh, vacuum tubes, and they didn't really have that much effect. Today, they might really have an effect on a computer or something that's not protected. Saucers of the light. We know, and it's historic fact, that they had flying saucers on the drawing board. We've already covered some of this in the rise of the Fourth Reich, so I'll skip on through it. We also talked about Action Adler Flug, or the uh, uh, Operation Eagle Flight, and how that the Nazis survived the war. Uh, Martin Bormann, who was uh, deputy to Hitler, Hermann Schmitz, the uh, head of IG Farben Combine, and by the way, also a man who owned as much stock in Standard Oil as John D. Rockefeller. And Dr. Hermann Joseph Abs, head of the German Central Bank, the Deutsche Bank, which is still one of the largest banks in the world and a very prominent player today. They created more than 750 corporations in addition to about 700 corporations that they had already had set up in Switzerland. And by these German companies and involving these American companies. And it was all handled through the Bank of International Settlements. There's a Deutsche Bank, Chase Bank, Union Banking Corporation. And of course, if you'll remember my talk from Rise of the Fourth Reich, who was handling the money for the Nazis through Union Banking Corporation? Prescott Bush. Bush, okay, the grandfather of George W. and the father of George Herbert Walker Bush. The attorneys for the Nazi Schroeder Bank that was handling it for uh, Baron von Schroeder, who was uh, was Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. Now this is how they, the Nazis got a foothold in the United States after the war, because after the war, uh, John J. McCloy who had been uh, head of, of, of uh, National Citibank, which is now Citicorp, uh, was one of the largest lenders of money to the Nazis. In fact, he sat in the same box with Hitler in the 1936 Olympics. And all of this just kept going. Business is just business. Uh, wasn't John... Had, wasn't he at that meeting the night before JFK was assassinated up in Dallas, John J. McCoy? That's possible. 
He had been in Texas along with Alan Dulles. I've seen a photograph of Alan Dulles with Lyndon Johnson taken uh, within days of the Kennedy assassination. So they were all together. That's, but this is another whole topic, okay? This, this goes back to the rise of the Fourth Reich. So let's keep moving along here. That brings us to what crashed at Roswell. That's the most famous of the crash recovery stories, but of course everybody, oh gosh, it was this, it was that, no, maybe it was this, who knows? Well, let's just look at it objectively. First off, the government has changed its story four times. Right off the bat, the base commander, Colonel Butch Blanchard, authorized the release of a news release that said, we have captured a flying saucer, okay? Higher authorities, General Ramey, over the uh, eight, uh, 6th Air Force, I guess it was, out of Carswell, said, uh, no, 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 they got it all wrong. It was not a flying saucer. It was just a weather balloon. They just mistook a weather balloon for this uh, flying saucer. Now, let me point out a few things here. Number one, the 509th Bomb Group at Roswell Army Airfield in uh, New Mexico was the only unit in the U.S. military at that time equipped with nuclear weapons. They were the group that dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These were the first strained guys. These were the best military people we had. And Major Marcel, who was their intelligence officer, had been on Tinian and had been involved in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And to tell us that these guys couldn't tell a flying saucer from balloon wreckage is an affront to your sensibilities. They're insulting your intelligence. And if that doesn't prove something to you, then how many of you guys have been in the military? Anybody? But it's good. Me too. Now, you know in the military, the surefire way to advancement is very simple. Don't screw up. <laughs> okay? Don't screw up. If you mind your P's and Q's, follow your orders, then chances are you can advance. Colonel Blanchard. Okay. He authorized the release, said, we've captured a flying saucer. And then they came back, our authorities, and said, no, 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 it was just a weather balloon. He screwed up. Okay? Either it was a flying saucer, and they didn't want that information out, which means he really messed up, or it really was a huge cock-up, and it was a weather balloon, in which case he screwed up, too. So, in the military, you know that if you mess up like that, his next assignment should have been Nome, Alaska, okay? That should have been the last we ever heard of Colonel Blanchard. Au contraire. Colonel Blanchard went on to become the second youngest Brigadier General in U.S. military history, second only to George Custer. And Custer's advancement to Colonel had been, a, or General, had been a mistake, okay? And at the time of his death in the late 60s, uh, Blanchard, General Blanchard, was, had been sent to Vietnam to write an overall report on our status in the Vietnam War. Whoa! This guy was a credible and promoted military leader. So in other words, when he said, we've captured a flying saucer, he was telling the truth. And when he backed off and followed orders and said, no, it was just a weather balloon, he was following orders. So he gets promoted. That's the way it works. Now, when all of this came about, uh, about uh, 1996 or so, the Air Force finally issued this report, the Roswell Report, stamped Case Closed. Does that sound familiar? They always say Case Closed. This is the final word. And in their background, they say, this comprehensive further examination of so-called Roswell incident found no evidence whatsoever of flying saucer space aliens Citizen government cover-up. By the way, that's interesting. They use the same <laughs> verbiage as the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission never said there was no conspiracy to kill Kennedy. What they said over and over again was, we could find no evidence of conspiracy. And of course they didn't, because they didn't go look for it. In fact, they systematically turned away. And he didn't look at any evidence in point of conspiracy. Same thing here. We could find no evidence of space aliens. Well, of course not. You can't get to it. Barry Goldwater tried to go to Wright Patterson to see if he could get in to view the space aliens. They wouldn't even let him in. You think they're going to let the guys writing this report in? But here's the clincher. By the time this report came out, they changed their story again. They said, okay, okay, it, it really wasn't a weather balloon. We lied about that because it was a secret mogul balloon. 
and the mogul balloon was not even secret. A mogul balloon was a weather balloon, basically. The only thing classified about mogul was that it carried this very sensitive um, testing equipment into the upper atmosphere to test, and they were testing to see if the Soviets were setting off nuclear weapons. Now, don't ask me why they thought they had to send up balloons from New Mexico <laughs> to see what the Soviets in Russia were setting off when they could have sent those balloons off from Turkey or Japan or any number of places that are much closer to the Soviet Union, because I don't know, and they never explain it. But, so the only thing secret and classified about the mobile balloons was simply the information, the software, that they were carrying. I might also point out that in one book written by a very pro mobile balloon explanation for Roswell, uh, he went a little overboard and he actually <laughs> gave every little statistical bit of information about the mobile balloon, and he pointed out that out of 22 releases of these mogul balloons, they only recovered eight. Why such a low number? Because, as he pointed out himself, they didn't bother to go look for any more. Well, how classified is that? You don't even bother to go look for them. But then that didn't really satisfy anybody, so by 1997 they had added something else, and that was crash dummies. <laughs> what they saw was crash dummies. Now, here's a picture, and by the way, this is uh, Raymond Madsen right here with his arm around one of the crash dummies. He was part of the crash dummy program, and I talked to Mr. Madsen, and he laughed at the whole idea that what they had seen in 1947 was crash dummies because, as you can obviously see, they look like humans. They weigh the state as, same as humans. It only makes sense if you're testing parachutes or uh, ejection seats or whatever, you don't want a little four-foot <laughs> alien-looking guy. You want some guy that weighs and looks like a human. Plus, he said that you wouldn't have any trouble identifying them. He said because one of the problems they had was that when they parachute these crash dummies out, the wind currents would catch them and scatter them all over the countryside. So they said on front and back they had a big stencil that says, Property of U.S. Air Force, $25 reward if you'll bring you back in, you know. None of that was found on whatever it was they found at Roswell. But here's the clincher. Obviously, you can see there's a whole lot of difference between a four-foot, big-headed alien and a six-foot, 200-pound crash dummy. But in this same Roswell report, where they're trying to tell us it's just crash dummies, they thoughtfully gave us a listing of the high-altitude balloon dummy drops. The very first one took place on June the 23rd, 1954. <laughs> now that leads me to recall when they had a press conference in, in 19, summer of 1997 and a Colonel Johnson got up and explained that what they'd seen was crash dummies and then he began to and commenced to show some old news footage of the crash dummies and some of the planes that were carrying them. And after he got through with his presentation and went to questions from the media, one of the more astute reporters said, Colonel Johnson said, you're telling us this is what they saw in 1947, said, but you're showing us data and uh, photographs that are obviously from the 1950s and 60s. And they came back to Johnson. You know what he said? I remember his words distinctly. He said, well, I really don't know what they saw in 1947. <laughs> And I thought, well then, why are you having this news conference? Yeah. <laughs> and why are we listening to you? But this is what's going on, folks. And, of course, uh, here's, here's General Ramey, um, right here, with his weather officer holding some weather balloon debris. And I talked to Bon Johnson, who was a reporter, a photographer for the Star-Telegram at that time. And he is convinced because he was there, they started to let them in, they suddenly rushed, pushed them all out of the room, held them around for a while, then let them back in, and here was Ramey and here was uh, the weather guy with this junk, and, he, and it didn't look like the same stuff they'd seen the first time. And he is still to this day convinced that they swapped the wreckage for this balloon debris, okay? But... Another thing is, is that when they took this, allowed these pictures to be made of them holding the balloon wreckage, 
you notice in Rainey's hand is a telegram. Now, this is a picture that was published in a book, and it's, you know, third, fourth generation, and out of the book, and pretty hazy, but uh, they've gotten hold of the original print of this, and thanks to computer digitization, they were able to blow up this telegram to the point to where they can read some of the words on it. And it says, bodies, <laughs> crash site, retrieval, okay? Something very totally different than the story that it was just a crash weather balloon. Of course, in 1947, General Ramey would have never in his wildest dreams thought that in the future that high school kids <laughs> would have computers and could analyze this photograph enough to be able to read the message on the on the telegram. Amazing. So now though we have, here's a partial list of uh, people who have now spoken out and said, I was there, I saw the debris, I picked up the bodies, I carried the bodies to Oswald Army Air Force, I uh, put them in boxes, I guarded the boxes, I loaded the boxes on aircraft, I flew the aircraft to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, yada, yada, yada. So, and also, we now have documents that have now given us a pretty good view of what actually happened, including July the 3rd, radar stations in, in that's West Texas, White Sands Proving Ground tracked two identified uh, uh, aircraft until both dropped off radar. The two crash sites have been located close to White Sands Proving Ground. Uh, site landing zone one was located at a ranch near Corona, approximately 75 miles northwest of the town of Roswell. Site landing zone two was located approximately 20 miles southeast of the town of Socorro, at latitude 33, 40, 31, longitude, blah, blah, blah. So in other words, there were two crash sites. Now this accounts for some of the confusion. People have argued, oh, it was at Corona, and others have argued, no, it was at Roswell. What apparently happened was this is all part of the same crash. The thing hit the ground, bam, and lost a lot of debris. This was the debris field. But then the major portion of it, or at least the flight compartment, the uh, the uh, command deck ricocheted and went way on over and ended up in a gully near Socorro. And this is reportedly where the bodies were found. So that's caused confusion, the fact that they've argued over was it this crash site or that crash site, and actually it's all part of the same crash. Um, interestingly enough, and this document is dated 1947, on arrival at landing zone two, that would be the command module, personnel assess the finds as not belonging to air, aircraft, rocket, weapons, or balloon tests that are normally conducted from surrounding bases. First reports indicated the first crash investigators from Roswell that landing zone one was the remains of an Army Air Force top secret mogul balloon. So originally they thought it was a mogul balloon. But when scientists from Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory arrived uh, to inspect landing zone two, it became apparent to all concerned that what had crashed in the desert was something out of this world. And they say, well, where's the pieces? Well, there are even pieces now that have been studied that, that they claim come from Roswell. And they uh, contain bismuth, zinc, and they're all, they're, I've held some of this in my own hand. It's obviously manufactured. This is not natural formations. They're layered, okay? And that is not been able, they've not been able to trace this to any manufacturing process known on the earth. So don't let anybody tell you that there's no hard evidence. Admittedly, these are little bitty pieces because where's the ship? Where's the body? They took them all away. They hid them away. So, with Roswell, it comes down to an article of faith. Do you want to believe the U.S. Air Force report with little or no documentation that says nothing happened? A few various debunkers with no first-hand information, and, or the news media, uh, which has no real knowledge of the issue, or do you want to believe the initial press release, more than 400, it's now 600 witnesses on the public record, thousands of leaked government documents, radar contacts, unknown bits of metal, 
and the fact that they went around making death threats to U.S. citizens in the wake of this Roswell incident. I don't care how important the mobile balloon was, it would have never justified telling police officers and even a 15-year-old girl that if you talk about this, they're going to be finding your bones out in the desert. I'm sorry, but there's no excuse for that kind of secrecy. Not in a democratic, free country, no matter how damaging the information may be. Let me tell you how to handle that. During World War II, the Japanese were testing what they call Fuego balloons or fire balloons, and they would launch these balloons from way up north, and they would drift across the Pacific and mostly come into the uh, Pacific Northwest. And they were timed so that at a certain time they would break loose and they'd drop firebombs, and the idea was to set big forest fires up in the Northwest to just confuse us, confound us, tie up men and material. One of them landed all the way like into Kansas or somewhere. A female reporter found out about it, went out, was on the scene, and said, boy, have I got a good story. We found this Japanese fire balloon here in Kansas. The FBI went to her and said, lady, if you run this story, the Japanese will be able to know where this balloon landed. They'll be able to calculate how effective the balloon was and what the wind currents are and everything else, and you're going to be giving aid and comfort to our enemy in a time of war. And she said, okay. And she did not publish the story until after the war. Now, that's the way you handle a secret. You don't make death threats against the civilian population. So, what do you, what do you want to believe? Did it happen or it didn't happen? It's up to you. All I can say is, the government says it didn't happen. Now, do we trust the government? <laughs> How many times have they lied to us? Uh, I lost count. I hate to say this. I, I want to be a true blue American. And I was in the Army. But I remember taking that oath. And I swore to protect not the President, not the Congress, not the state of Texas, I swore to protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic. And these are domestic enemies. We know about Colonel Carso. He found whistleblowers. There, the whistleblowers are all over the place. You would have heard more except for the control media and except for the fact that so many of them are hesitant to speak out because many of them did sign secrecy oaths and the people who reach rank in the military are generally men of honor and, uh, and, and integrity. And when they pledge that they'll not talk about something, then generally they don't. The onus does not lie with them. The onus lies with the people who made them promise to be sex secret about what is probably the most stupendous story in the history of the human race. And they're supposed to shut up about it. Even... Astronauts have said that we have gained material based on crashed alien vehicles. Where it all came down, and this was the start of the whole problem we have, was the National Security Act of 1947. Now, before 1947, there had been a little talk about changing the name of, from the War Department to the Defense Department. Well, that's a little public relations move. Nobody wants to think they're supporting the war, but everybody wants to support defense. That's ah, just PR. Okay, and there had been talk about separating the Air Force from the Army. It used to be the Army Air Corps, you know. And, um, and there had been talk about coordinating the intelligence services through a central intelligence agency to prevent duplication of effort with the Naval Intelligence, Army Intelligence, Air Force Intelligence. But what really got the ball rolling was Roswell. Immediately after the crash at Roswell, which is early July 1947, immediately they began to quickly put together the National Security Act of 1947 to rush into law. And in September of 1947, Harry Truman, who was president, was trying to get home to visit his mother who was dying, and they held him at National Airport for hours until they could rush out this National Security Act to get his signature on it so that, bam, they could make it into law. Why the rush? 
And what did it do? It separated the Air Force from the Army, created the Air Force branch, we know that. It renamed the War Department to the Defense Department. It created the CIA, which has been the bane of our existence ever since. But what a lot of people miss is probably the most important facet of the National Security Act of 1947. It created the National Security Council. And if you'll think about it, everything from Vietnam to the invasion of Panama to the invasion of that island down in the Caribbean, whose name escapes me at the moment, Granada, to everything else going on is all the National Security Council. And what I did just tell you, Barack Obama's National Security Advisor said there's a command chain that still exists in the National Security Council. The Iran-Contra scandal. General, uh, Colonel North, who's admitted he lied to Congress and hence lied to the American public. But he said, but I had full approval of the president. The problem is he didn't say which president. Everybody thought he meant President Reagan. But it turns out that all the documents signed on the Iran-Contra scandal were all signed by Vice President Bush. So Bush has been giving us trouble all along. But it's all done under the National Security Council because anything that smacks of national security obviously would come under the purview of the National Security Council. This, my friends, is when they bypassed the Constitution, the Congress, the news media, and the American public. This is when the shadow government came into being. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the items they had to keep secret was UFOs. And this is still being held within the Technology Committee, or whatever they want to call it, of the National Security Council. And who's in charge of that? I've already told you. Henry Kissinger, for God's sakes. Okay? And this is where the secret has been held all this time. A secret that you, all your neighbors, everyone on earth should know about. What's the secret? We are not alone. Okay? For better or for worse. Who knows? We could argue all night over whether are they good or they bad or whatever. We get some of that. They immediately created Majestic 12. Here are the original members. Okay? One of them, uh, James Forrestal, our very first Secretary of Defense, uh, apparently didn't go along with this program because they said, well, he's got a mental problem. They put him in Bethesda Naval Hospital and he either fell or was pushed out of a 17-story window. But we now find out, and all these documents have le leaked out, including this uh, manual, Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal, uh, Standard Operating Manual 101. All right? Press blackout. Never let the press know what's going on. This all stems back to early 50s. 1952, when flying saucers came over Washington, they were, and at that time, everybody in the city could see them. The news media rushed out to National Airport and uh, were going to take pictures of the radar screens that were picking them up, and they got chased out. National security. And then later, we were told it was just temperature inversion. <laughs> Swamp gas. Swamp gas. Now, one of the reasons for this uh, uh, secrecy was because they commissioned the Brookings Institution to do a study to try to figure out what, what happens if a, a less advanced culture comes into contact with a more technological advanced culture. So the Brookings Institution went back. All they had to work with was history. So they went back and said, well, they said, Earth civilization may topple if faced by a race of superior beings. Okay, in other words, man, stock market could crash. <laughs> you know, uh, we might, lay, you know, and here's the clincher. What was left unsaid, because the true rulers of this country, and I'm not talking about the president or the congressman, or uh, I'm talking about the people who run the banks, people who own the banks, the people who own the Federal Reserve says, and I'm talking about the people who really run this country. They owe their wealth and their power to their monopolies over energy, medicine, telecommunications, transportation. Okay? 
They don't really drugs, of course. They don't really care if you know that there's extraterrestrials out there. Obviously, I mean, Star Trek, Star Wars, The X-Files. By the way, a new movie out right now, Race to Witch Mountain. Go see it. Pretty good. It's really interesting. The DODs, the bad guys, the aliens are the good guys. Ah, and, and it shows, it kind of makes fun of the UFO crowd. And yet, if you think about it at the end of the program, it's, well, those guys were right. So... We're in a reverse conditioning process now. But anyway, yeah, they don't care if you know about aliens. But if you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that extraterrestrials exist, then you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that there is alternative technology. And you're not going to sit still for $4 a gallon gasoline prices and for this crappy drugs that they're pushing off on everybody, and et cetera, et cetera. That's the reason for the secrecy. But they used the Brookings Institution report for a good number of years to say, we can't release this to the public, or they'll panic, you know. And you know what? Actually, I'll try to, to try to give the devil his due. There is some reason for that. In 1947 or by 1950, uh, this was only uh, 10 years or so more since the famous War of the Worlds broadcast by Orson Welles, 1938. And number one, I don't think it's really proper to, to judge that against a calm and reasoned release of information. In other words, Orson Welles, some of you are probably very familiar with it, some of you are not. In 1938, Orson Welles took... Um, uh, H.G. Wells' book, The War of the Worlds, and dramatized it on the Mercury Theater of the Air on radio, which was a national radio broadcast, and they did it like it was a live report, okay? And at the very beginning of the program, they said, hey, happy Halloween, here's a, here's a program to scare you, and this is all just made up, and, you know, ha have a happy Halloween. But then they started on the program, and you'd hear dance music, and they said, we interrupt this program to bring you a news flash from New Jersey. These soldiers have landed, and uh, something seems to be coming out. A few minutes later, you go back to music. They said, we break in again. Those soldiers, something's coming out of the cylinders, and then they're blowing up whole cities, and uh, people are dying. Oh, my God, the humanity, you know. Well, no wonder people panic. You know, they turn in a little bit late. They didn't get the word. They just weren't real. And they didn't have other channels to go to like we do now. Those of you who are my age or so might recall at the time of the Kennedy assassination, you turn on every radio station, every TV station, what did you get? The Kennedy assassination. They preempted everything. 9-11 wasn't even that way. 9-11, all the news channels and all the broadcast channels were all talking about 9-11, but you could still turn to cable and satellite, you could watch a movie and you could act like it wasn't happening. So, but back then in radio, that's all they had. So yes, there was a lot of people who panicked and stampeded. And this was not lost on these people. So between the Brookings Institution report and the recent memory, there might have been some reason at that point to at least play down the idea of extraterrestrial visitation. But the time has long passed. We've all grown up with Star Wars, Star Trek. You ask any young person today, what about ETs? And they go, yeah, so what? <laughs> you know, they're used to it. But all the way back there in 1952, they instituted a policy of control and denial with an added factor of ridicule. You didn't see anything, and if you keep saying you did, and you probably need psychological counseling. And this has been extremely effective in keeping this whole topic off the table. This is why in 1997, when I published Alien Agenda, which was nothing but a report on what was available to the public about UFOs and extraterrestrials, I'm boycotted. I'm shunned. This is why Kevin doesn't even want, doesn't even want to be associated with anybody that talked about UFOs. Nobody in the media today wants to touch it. But thankfully, it is now changing. And again, let me reemphasize, 
If you dismiss the topic of UFOs and extraterrestrials, you'll never figure out what's really going on in the world because you're throwing out a very big and important piece of the puzzle. Um, did Kennedy know about all this? Uh, the tabloids reported that he was shot to keep, the, to keep from revealing to the people uh, that the reality of UFOs. Now, when I first heard this back in the 70s, I snickered and I said, no way. But yet, there may be a modicum of truth to this. Because we found from the Counterintelligence Corps report of 1947, way back at the back, it states that it has become known to counterintelligence that some of the recovery operation was shared with Representative John F. Kennedy. Massachusetts Democrat, elected to Congress in 46, son of Joseph P. Kennedy, who was on the Commission of Organization of the Executive Branch of the Government. Kennedy had limited duty as naval intelligence, a naval officer assigned to naval intelligence during the war, and is believed that the information was obtained from a source in Congress who was close to the Secretary of the Air Force. How many of you knew that John F. Kennedy had been with naval intelligence? Not very many. But he was. And I won't go into that whole story. That's inconvenient. You love that. But that's true. So this is, this is a true remark, and this is true information. So this that tells us that John F. Kennedy in 1947 was one of the few people who knew that Roswell was real. So that brings us to 1961, June, where he is ordering, he wrote a brief summary of your, uh, at your earliest convenience, uh, a review of MJ-12 intelligence operations. Uh-oh, he wants to know about MJ-12. He wants to know about the se most secret thing we had going, because MJ-12 was in charge of UFOs. Whose signature was that? That's John F. Kennedy's. That's his signature. Now, Glenn Pace and Rufus Bond in uh, 1963 were photographers working at what is now uh, Area 51. And I think they were calling it Groom Lake at the time. Now they didn't have access to any alien technology or any UFO secrets, but they did share a lunchroom with some of the Nazi scientists who were still there working and who probably did have access to some of our most secret UFO uh, information. And they tell the story that uh, in the fall of early fall of, uh, or actually this was probably in the spring or early summer of 1963, because it had to be before the Merrill Monroe memo, they uh, they said these German scientists and these other scientists that had been working at the very top secret levels at Area 51 were laughing and snickering because they said the president was going to come for a visit, and the idea was we'll give him the usual dog and pony show and tell him there's nothing here and buy him a lunch, and he'll go away. Then they said that after the presidential visit in this lunchroom, everybody was scowling and cursing and saying, rah, 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 he's going to cut our budget. And obviously the visit was not a pleasant experience. So apparently what happened was, Kennedy shows up, they give him the usual runaround, nothing here, Mr. President, but based on that document from 1947, he knew better. So he says, you're lying to me, I'm going to cut your budgets. And I'm going to regain control over this whole thing. So now we find that on November the 12th, less than a month before he was killed in Dallas, he issues this directive to the Director of Central Intelligence, a review of all UFO intelligence files. He said, as I was discussed with you previously, I've initiated and have instructed James Webb, who at that time was head of NASA, to develop a program with the Soviet Union in joint space and lunar exploration. And it would be very helpful if you would have the high threat cases reviewed for the purpose of identification of bona fide as opposed to classified CIA and UFO sources. It's important that we make a clear distinction between the knowns and the unknowns in the event the Soviets try to mistake our extended cooperation as a cover for intelligence gathering of their defense and space programs. Now, number one, 1963, and Kennedy was going to have joint space exploration, and he demands all the UFO files out of the CIA. He would have made it public. He was shaking it all up. And 
This same document that I retrieved out of the Kennedy Library shows that he has sent a, mem sent a memorandum to James Webb, the administrator for NASA, and he says, uh, basically he's telling him to cooperate with the Soviet Joint Space Exploration. Now in 1963, most of y'all don't remember 1963, but you remember the Reagan years, the evil empire? We were still in a Cold War in the 1980s. Kennedy was trying to end it. And he was going into joint space exploration. That should have been a huge story, but nobody ever get told about this, okay? And by the way, all of this has been totally confirmed by Nikita Khrushchev's son, who said, yes, uh, he knew all about this. They were getting ready to go and, and end the Cold War. And if they had turned over UFO information to the White House, it would have leaked. It would have all come out. But before the month of about, Kenny was shot in the head. Covering up LBJ scowling face there with that article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great picture. LBJ's looking at him like your time is coming. Okay, this is an interesting sidelight. In in the mid 50s, 1954. This was uh, three years before the Soviets put Sputnik in or, or, uh, orbit. It was announced in the New York Times and various other publications. I couldn't believe this when I was researching for my book, Alien Agenda, so I went and looked it all up. It was in Time, Newsweek. They said they had just discovered two giant satellites orbiting the Earth at the equator. One of them was 600 miles out, one of them was 800 miles out, and they were traveling about 18,000 miles an hour. And they got the famous astronomer, uh, Tom Ball, Clyde Tombaugh, to set up a satellite watch system. They wanted it, and they was while they were publicizing this, they wanted everybody in the world to set up their telescopes and help them spot these two satellites that were revolving around the Earth. And then some scientists were theorizing that they could use them as a stepping stone to the moon. In other words, they launch a rocket, they land on the first satellite, launch a rocket, land on the second one, and then use that one to go on out into space and go to the moon, okay? And then all reports on this stop because they went away <laughs> think about it folks what naturally could come into orbit around the earth and then go away it was all there but you don't get told about this so it didn't happen it dropped in the old memory hole then we have on December the 9th 1949 a Japanese astronomer looked through his telescope at what appeared to be a giant explosion took place on Mars. The blast was followed by a luminescent cloud and estimated 40 miles high. Now, what was that all about? That was all about because, again, it was reported that right after we had set off the nuclear bombs in Japan, they got the bright idea of uh, maybe we could tell what other worlds are like by shooting a nuclear bomb up to Mars and setting it off, and then we could study the cloud formations and the dust and everything else. And there's no hard evidence to show that this happened, but you've got this astronomer who saw this giant explosion in 1949, and uh, could this be one reason that the ETs came around? You know, what would you do if your neighbors started shooting, uh, you know, RPG rockets into your front yard? You go over to find out what was up, right? What are you doing? And this is, I think, in this theory, this is what happened when we set off the first atomic explosions because when you set off a nuclear explosion, you're tampering with the basic molecular structure of the universe. And it goes far beyond just the immediate area of the blast. You've got energy perturbations that go out through the entire universe. And I think somewhere somebody said, Holy crap, the kids found the matches. <laughs> and they came to find out what was going on because 1946, you had the fireballs over Sweden. 1947, you got the Roswell crash plus a spate of flying saucer stuff and it continued unabated. By the way, just something else too, and this is, this is a semi-theory. The facts are, are correct. But my conclusion, I'll have to admit, is just based on common sense. About 1952, the Air Force issued directives to shoot down any UFO. If you see them, shoot them. And over the next year, there was a huge spate of airline crashes. 
They were just dropping out of the sky. You can go back and check the record. And then the Air Force backed off and sent out a new directive and said, if you see a UFO, track it, follow it, but don't shoot at it. And the airline crashes stopped. Yeah. Were we in a little subtle war with them? And did they let us know that, hey, you shoot at us, we can take care of you? <laughs> Interesting. Very. Abductions. <laughs> Cattle mutilations. With cattle mutilations, the human abduction thing will save for later. There are literally thousands of people who claim that they've been abducted by aliens, and they all can't be nuts. Dr. John Mack at the, we'll just look at him, unfortunately got killed, run over by a driver in uh, England. And by the way, for you conspiracy-minded people, I looked into that quite carefully, and I think it was truly an accident. Because the guy that hit Mack stopped, tried to give him aid, and let me tell you something, I almost got run over in England, too, <laughs> because they drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and you go up there and you look and you don't see anybody, so you start to walk across and they're coming this way at you, okay? So, but it was very unfortunate because Dr. John Mack was a very distinguished Harvard academic and who made a very, very thorough study and concluded, based on all of his work, that these abductions are real and that the only logical explanation was that these people had had face-to-face uh, -face experiences with extraterrestrials. He got in trouble for this, of course. And they had a peer review there at Harvard and everybody was going, oh my gosh, he's going to get kicked out. Uh-uh. They went back and they said, we're not even going to rule on what he's talking about, about aliens or whatever. We're simply looking at his methodology. And what the peer review panel came to was that his methodology was solid. Well, that's about as close as you can come to saying, yeah, he's right. And it's unfortunately that, unfortunate that we lost this thing. Cattle mutilations. Going back to the time I worked at the Star Telegram, we were having cattle mutilations all around here. And folks, they're still happening today. Still going on, but you don't read about it because the paper doesn't report on it. Typical deal. Well, yeah, it happened, but hey, that's old news. Well, who's behind it? We don't know. Well, then we don't want to run the story. And here just shows uh, the, the years they've happened all over the United States and actually all over the world. They cover many countries, many years, surgical precision, only at night. And uh, I talked to Gabe Valdez and he says it's hard to believe that predators can pull a steer's heart out to a small hole in its neck. And I've seen that. I went to the one and only cattle mutilation conference in New Mexico back about 1979. And this place was packed with ranchers, farmers, law enforcement people from all around the country. And they were dead serious. They wanted to know what was going on. And a guy named Rommel, an <laughs> FBI official, gets up before anything can be said and says, gentlemen, I'd like to tell you that uh, we ask you not to say anything that might be used in a future court case. Well, of course, they catch somebody. They got a, everything they know. Could be, and so they all admitted, they said, we've been muzzled. And that was the end of that. So they keep the lid on, and they don't tell you about all this. It's still going on. It's not getting reported on. I myself held in my hand some color slides and that made by Arkansas State Patrolmen who had gone out to a cattle mutilation. This is simulated, just so you can see what I'm talking about. They had gone out to a, cattle, a typical cattle mutilation and, and had treated it like a crime scene. And they took 35 millimeter camera and they made color slides. And then when they went back and uh, didn't notice anything out of the ordinary other than the precision surgically cut holes in the cow and the fact that soft tissue had been removed. They went back, developed it, turned it into slides and said when they looked at it, they were astounded because you could clearly see a cone of blue light rising out of the side of the cow and then just stopping. Well, how do you stop light? That's pretty odd itself. And folks, I've seen this. I held those slides in my house and in my hands and looked at them. And they said, what's this? So they figured, well, the ca something's wrong with the camera. Or we had bad film. So they took the camera apart, worked on it, got it where they knew it was okay, then got new film, went out there, they couldn't see anything at the scene, take pictures, they go back, 
there's the blue cone of light. Amazing. Something's going on beyond our kin. What's going on with the cattle mutilations? Now, okay, this is, again kind of falls under theory, but it's informed theory. At the A&M, it was reported that humans share many of their innermost genetic secrets represented by perfect match chromosomes with another mammal, cows. We have 23 chromosomes in our DNA makeup. They have 23. And, as they say, you are what you eat. <laughs> and we eat a lot of beef, right? Now, think about it. If somebody wanted to come and cut open some earth creatures to find out how bad pollution was getting, uh, wouldn't it be better to leave a few mutilated cows around than a whole thousands of mutilated humans? <laughs> So the thing is that I found out in my research of looking into the animal mutilation is there's two things. Every time you had animal mutilations, you had UFO reports. Every time you had cattle mutilations and UFO reports, you had reports of strange blacked out helicopters with no markings, strange trucks roaring up and down the back country roads. So it became obvious to me that the two were intertwined. So where we are is Either the cattle mutilations are being conducted by ETs and the U.S. government is secretly chasing around after them to figure out what they're up to, or the cattle mutilations are being conducted by the U.S. government with the ETs chasing around, trying to see what they're up to. I personally suspect it's the former, although I think some of those mutilations probably were committed by the government, because, but simply in copycat manner to try to figure out what are they doing and what are they doing. They're taking sex origin, they're taking the soft tissue. This is where pollution would gather the strongest and, and, and the most. This is how they could determine what the ecology of the planet is doing. And of course you know about crop circles, but I'll just kind of skim on through this pretty quick. Crop circles are amazing and we find that, number one, they're very often associated with sacred sites. That Stonehenge right across the way is one of my favorite crop circles. It's made up of 140 circles. Now, you tell, look at that. Just look at it for a minute. And you tell me if two guys with a board and some string did that. September 11th. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they finally said it was Doug and Dave. These yeah. two pub crawlers over in England. Once the story about the crop circles just grew and grew, and even the establishment media was beginning to talk about it, okay, then all of a sudden Doug and Dave came forward and said, Oh, it was us. We go down to the pub, we get a little loaded, we go out with a string, we're tromping all around, you know, and the media bought it, okay, just like they bought Phoenix. Oh, it was military flares. Yeah, it was military flares. They dropped them at 10.30 at night. But that doesn't explain what flew over Phoenix at 8.30. Okay? So then they let the whole thing drop. They didn't have sense enough, the media did, to go back and simply check the record. The very year that Doug and Dave was public and said, yeah, we hoaxed 200 crop circles. If they'd simply gone and done their homework, they would have found there were 2,000 crop circles and that they covered not only England, but America, Canada, Australia, okay? So what, Doug and Dave were flying all over the place? Of course, you don't hear about Doug and Dave anymore because I forget, one of them, I forget, Doug maybe, he died. So it wasn't, so Dave couldn't go out there and do it all by himself now. Are there host crop circles? Yes, there are. And, but they go back through history. Here's a woodcut from talking about the mowing devil so it's nothing really that new. Here's another incredibly complex uh, crop circle. Uh, I think I actually figured out what they're all about. They're intergalactic corporate logos. <laughs> yeah, it does. It looks like the trilateral logo, doesn't it? But it's easy enough to tell a legitimate crop circle from a hoax crop circle. Are there hoax crop circles? Yeah, there are. In fact, now there's groups of people over in England who get their jollies going out and trying to hoax as complicated a crop circle as they can do. 
But it's really simple to tell a real one from a fake one. In the fake ones, they do exactly what you'd expect. They go out with a board and a string, and they go in a circle, and they trump down the crop, whether it's corn or whether it's grape or rapeseed, whatever. And as you would expect, the crop is mashed, the stems are broken, the leaves are stripped off, so it's easy to tell that. In a real crop circle, the plants lay down, but they don't die. They keep growing, but they will never stand up again. And they go in a swirl, and sometimes they're braided. And they're in layers, and one layer will grow crop, uh, clockwise, the layer on top of them will be counterclockwise. What can do that? We don't know, but certainly not anything human. And you can tell because here are normal wheat nodes, and the ones, and I've got some of these in my possession, the nodes on the crop circles are blown out, kind of like popcorn, as though they have been exposed to intense microwave energy. Same thing that happens to that popcorn in your microwave. And here we see the crop that has been bent over, but it's still living, but it just can't stand up again. This has all been thoroughly documented by Dr. Livingood. We also find that uh, they found a, a, ther a Euclidean theory expressed in the crop circles that is not known to humans. Nobody had ever done that before. And they don't tell you about the best ones, such as this one at Chibolton in 2001. Here's the Chibolton Radio Telescope. <coughs> In 1974, we sent this into space, which is a binary code that tells us that uh, here's some binary numbers. Uh, that's telling the atomic elements. This tells us, uh, uh, gives us in binary code the makeup of human DNA. This gives a little body of a, of a human. And this tells the, uh, the, uh, our solar system with the Earth uh, offset. So it shows we come from the third planet from our sun. Okay, and in 2001, we get this sent back in the field across from the Chilbolton Radio Telescope. In, no, that's that's see the wheel tracks. No, those are those are crop, but it's not real high. And they show us that they come from the third, fourth, fifth, and I guess sixth planets of their system. And look at their little figure. Big head, little bitty body, and the, and the DNA is slightly different. So did we get an answer back? Well, if we did, we're not being told about it. And wow, here, did they show us who's sending it? This is a hoax one, okay? Everybody got excited when they saw this one and then ran out. Of course, it's all trampled down. It's obviously a hoax one. But that one's not. And this one came along with a face. Isn't that interesting? But in 2002, we got this one with a face and a formation that is in code, binary numbers, and it is translated as, Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. Believe there is good out there. We oppose deception. Conduit closing. And that's the last one we've gotten like that. So I guess the conduit closed. Now the question is, who are they talking about? The bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Could it be the ETs that have made deals with our military industrial complex? Could it be the ETs that were in touch with the Nazis and gave them superior technology? We don't know. One of the reasons we don't know is because there's been these conditioning programs. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. In 1998, as they were clearing uh, the Amazon rainforest, they discovered the Karubos, a Stone Age tribe. 
In the past, we were rushed in there, said, here, put some clothes on. And by the way, here's a Bible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the tax man will be right along. <laughs> but this time, we had progressed and we had become a little more sophisticated. And so we cordoned off the area and uh, embargoed that whole area. Not to keep them in, but to keep everybody else out. We quarantined them. And then we sent in a team of anthropologists who, over time, allowed themselves to be seen. They'd be up on a mountain and they'd wave to them, you know, and then they'd get a little closer, be down to the middle of the mountain and they'd wave at them. And finally, they're across the clearing from them and they'd wave at them. And they got them used, they conditioned them to the fact that they were there and that they were friends. And finally, they made contact. And then, and only then, they, the only thing they did was give them some metal knives to improve their lot in life, but not enough that would totally disrupt and destroy their culture because we wanted to study them to find out how Stone Age people live. Folks, I submit to you the same thing is happening to us. We, they are letting themselves be seen. They are letting themselves be known. And we are in a conditioning process so that we, and it's working, because in the 50s, national polls showed that virtually no one believed there was any life outside of the earth. Okay? Today, the polls show quite the opposite. Today, 85% or higher said, yeah, yeah, there's probably life out there. So that's been a very effective conditioning process over about the past 50, 60 years. Now the danger is coming in. Because now the danger is, now that we're all becoming aware that, yeah, there could be life out there, and that's okay. Now the danger is, is that our military-industrial complex, who is capable of pulling off events like 9-11 using non-public technology so that everyone understands that it was an inside job and nobody quite, and we're all arguing over exactly what caused it all. What caused all the destruction of that concrete? What could bring these modern buildings down into their own footprint? You know, what could destroy those 47 steel girders in the middle of the buildings? We argue fire, thermite, everything, space beam weapons, who knows. And all of it sounds ridiculous and we're all fighting among ourselves and nothing's getting decided, okay? And they can use this same technology to simulate a threat from space. And this is not my theory, okay? This goes back to the early 70s when Carol Rosen, who went on to become the first woman executive of Fairchild Industries, was working with Dr. Werner von Braun, that highly decorated Nazi who came over here and became the father of our space program. And he told her back in the early 70s that the enemy du jour of today is uh, the communist. He said, but it's all lying. He said, when that doesn't work anymore, it's going to be terrorist, probably centered in the Middle East. He said, but that's a lie. He said, when that no longer works, and it's getting a little thin right now, isn't it? We're all kind of going, wait a minute, you know, why are we losing all our liberties? Why are we losing our daughters and our sons over in Iraq and Afghanistan? I mean, where's Osama anyway, you know? And so it's wearing thin now. He said the next one will be a threat from space. Exactly what Ronald Reagan spoke about in front of the United Nations. And see, that's what's kept modern presidents in line. Reagan might have been an okay guy. But they tell Reagan, listen, we've got to keep all this secret because if it all comes out, it's going to be disruption. The stock market will crash. The economy will fail. And the space aliens will come in and take over. So in other words, that keeps them in line. And it's and as Von Braun said, it's all a lie. Yeah, How do I know it's a lie? Because if the objective of space aliens was to come and blow up our cities and eat us or whatever, <coughs> as in the movie Independence Day, they'd have done it long before now. Okay? <laughs> well, boy, they would have done it in 1947 when the only thing we had to fight them off with was machine guns and propeller-driven aircraft. Why wait until we have, uh, uh, you know, space beam weapons and, uh, you know, space flat part parts, particle beam weapons, all kinds of things, lasers? Why wait until then? Nah, nah, ain't gonna happen. 
But I submit to you that like the tribe in the Amazon, we're under quarantine. They let us go a little bit out. They let us get to the moon, but we hadn't gone back. And we hadn't gone anywhere else. If we had the technology to get to the moon in 1969, don't you think we could have gone to Mars by now? But we haven't. And believe me, it's not about the money. When they finally shut down the Apollo program, and we didn't send anybody back out to the moon, we had 22 of those rockets, those... Uh, Saturn rockets ready to go but we just stopped and they tried to say well it's just too expensive well that's like saying well we built this Rolls Royce but we don't have any money for gas <laughs> come on something's going on and we're being lied to as we always are we are actually pretty insignificant. <laughs> we are on a third-rate planet, on a fourth-rate sun, out on the outer boondocks of our galaxy. Okay? And for us to think that we are the apex of evolution is, is just about the, the most arrogant, chauvinistic thinking that I can even come up with. Okay? But things are changing. In December of 2012, our sun comes into direct alignment with the center of our galaxy. And already they are picking up radio signals coming out of the center of the galaxy on a regular basis. And even the normally conventional and far from radical National Geographic raised the question, could they be coming from intelligent sources? So things are happening out there, and if you want to keep up with what's happening, you've got to use your mind like a parachute, okay? It works better when it's open. <laughs> so keep open to all of this. If, you want to, if you've never entertained any thoughts about UFOs or about ETs and want to get straight facts, read my book, Alien Agenda. It's simply a journalistic account of everything we know from ancient astronauts, everything I've talked about, plus so much more, plus remote viewing. It's yeah, all in remote there. Viewing, yeah, yeah. And is it them or us when we see all this stuff flying in the skies? And... Now, those of you who've attended my other talks, we know that somebody's trying to rule us, right? Somebody's trying to rule and control the whole human population through secrecy and deceit. Now, we go back, we've already looked at the ancient records, we've already looked at the Sumerian tablets. They tell us that in prehistory, these ETs had colonized on the earth. And they even say, and there are people like Sitchin who try to say that they created us as a worker race. Let me clarify this. Even they, it, they themselves had the same ethical arguments that we're having today. It's not right to act like God and create something. And the counter argument was, we're not creating anything. We're just improving the breed. Whoa, well, wait a minute. Isn't that what we do with cows? And horses, sheep, dogs, cats, we breed them to improve the breed. And that's what they did. So don't get off in this thing thinking, saying that people are claiming that uh, aliens created us. They didn't cre Nobody's trying to say that aliens created humans out of nothing. What they're saying is, is that they took Neanderthal, they tweaked with his DNA, and they produced Cro-Magnon, modern man. And this is why, by the way, that they will never, they have never, and will never find the missing link. Because there is no missing link. They simply, did, and of course, up until recently, nobody understood about cloning or genetic manipulation or whatever. But they did. They even explained how they did it. In the Sumerian tablets, it said they took the egg of a earth primitive female, shall we call her Lucy, <laughs> and they impregnated it with the sperm of an Anunnaki male, and then implanted the fertilized egg in the, uh, in the womb of an Anunnaki female. She carried it to term, and then through cesarean section, delivered a hybrid that they called the Adama, the Adam. Adam? Wait a minute. The earth 
the first earth man. So they even explained how they did it. Of course, the problem was when they first read these ancient tablets or back in the 1800s when they were first discovered, they didn't have a clue about atoms, much less genetic splicing or, you know, or, uh, or gen genetic manipulation. So they simply said, oh, well, that's their gods and these are their mythology. In fact, you can actually go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, look up Sumerian mythology, and you'll pretty much hear the correct story. But it's just a, the only difference is, is that they say, well, they're just making this up. It's mythology. And a growing number of scholars are now saying, no, it wasn't just made up mythology. They were giving us our history. And this is what really happened. But we didn't understand that until recently when we could do genetic manipulation. Okay? So... Assuming these ETs were on the earth way back then and they did all this, what happened to them? Did they all leave? Or did at least some of them stay behind? Well, how do we answer that? Real simple. We look at the historical record. If the historical record is, as we have been taught in school, one slow evolutionary climb of mankind, hunter-gatherers, you know, into community, agricultural communities and and I heard a great one the other day. The, the reason that men built towns was, was, uh, and developed agriculture was so they could make beer. <laughs> and then they gathered in towns so they could be close to the brewery. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Oh, hell yeah. But then on up through city-states and nations and empires, okay? But hey, that's not what the historical record shows, does it? The record speaks for itself all the way back. You've got the air raid of 1942, you've got crop circles, you've got the flying shields of the Romans, you've got the flying dragons, you've got all these anomalies that we've already talked about. So, that means that some of them, at least, are still here. So, what does that mean? Well, there's three possibilities. Number one, we know through the historical record that some of them are still here. We also know that there's a ruling clique that's trying to gain control over us. So, the ruling elite are trying to contact these ancient creators. Or two, they've already contacted the ancient creators and are being guided or controlled by them. Or three, they are the ancient creators. Oops, I'm starting to sound like David I. <laughs> hey, all right, all right. And that's all right. it. Thank you. All right, I know, I know a lot of you have been sitting here a long time, and it's not going to bother me if you want to go move around or go find a... Oh, yeah. But I will... I will throw it open... Or if you've got any questions, I will try to answer it. Uh, but be sure to shout out your question. I'm going to repeat it here so everybody can hear the question. Yes, sir. The three po he said we could repeat the three possibilities. If you assume that the ancient Sumerian tablets are correct and these ETs colonize the earth way back there, probably setting up a worldwide highly technological civilization which for some reason either through war or natural disasters <laughs> collapsed and left us with just vague memories uh, of, for example, Atlantis, you know, everybody talks about Atlantis and there's all these questions about Atlantis. Oh, there's an island in the Atlantic. No, it was the island of Santorini. No, it was the island of Cyprus. No, it was Antarctica before the pole shift. Okay, I submit to you, I suspect the truthful answer is yes, all of the above. We have these pyramids on the Giza Plateau. We have pyramids in China. We have pyramids in Eastern Europe. We have pyramids in South America, Central America. I think that at one point there was a worldwide highly technological civilization which fell apart, again, either due to war and or natural disasters. And so what we're left with, and you, uh, uh, all of these anomalies, is bits and pieces that we're sifting through thousands of years later and trying to figure out what is all this meaning. But 
they obviously, if they were here then, then it appears they're still here, or at least remnants of them. And uh, the thing that worries me is, is that if they are in connection with the world's ruling elite, and the reason that I don't think the world's ruling elite is really, I don't put them under the classification of good guys, because, simply because, look at their track record. Just over the last hundred years, two world wars, depressions, starvation, still going on, pollution, uh, pollution uh, the creation of deadly diseases, dissemination of deep diseases. Are all of y'all aware that we may have narrowly defeated, narrowly missed a pandemic yeah. of avian yeah. flu well, thanks still, to some alert checks? who decided to check the Baxter flu vaccine, which had been adulterated with the deadly avian flu exactly. and sent to 18 countries. Yeah, yeah. and what have we been warned about by our national leaders? Yeah. Well, it's not if, but when we're going to have this national yeah. pandemic. And what is the game plan of the ruling elite to cull the human population?